Breitbart and a one-time congressional candidate, um, and a really just a, a, a wide uh, breadth of knowledge that encompasses everything. So really pleased to be able to uh, start the program by turning it over to Alex, and then we'll hear from Joel, and then we'll have a lot of time for your questions. Good afternoon. I'm going to try to project. Can you guys hear me for now? Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. If, if, I, if I wind up uh, going down in volume, just uh, give me one of these. <laughs> anyway, my name is Alex Trayman. I'm the CEO and the Jerusalem Bureau Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate. JNS.org. Just in case I forget, I'm just going to mention it right now that we are a reader-supported 501c3 news agency. Enough said. I'm not going to go into it more. Um, since this war started, since the minute we heard about the attack on October 7th, you know, I was awoken to air raid sirens, had to take my wife and my kids, you know, in their pajamas barefoot into, uh, into bomb shelters. Uh, we learned about the horrific tragedy, and from the moment that that happened, We've been working around the clock, I, an unbelievable effort to keep up with this uh, ever-changing news cycle. Uh, but in addition to uh, just publishing the news on our website, I knew that we had to take immediate action and we launched an immediate campaign uh, for mainstream media. And I've personally done about 70 interviews on mainstream media, including on CBS, Fox, Bloomberg, BBC, Newsmax, Scripps TV, I don't know, whatever, I can't even keep track. <laughs> and you all understand that, and, and, and by the way, just uh, before I go a little bit further, the, the, the format of this, of this is that we're going to speak for just a couple minutes, and then we're really going to open the floor to questions. I've taken hundreds and hundreds of questions from reporters, some of them very smart questions, some of them unbelievably stupid and biased questions. So I, I am very happy to take all of your questions on any topic, and, and we'll do that. I'm not going to give you now the update on the war, but I'll just give you one example. Everybody understands that the, the information war, the media war, is one of the key arenas, one of the key battlefields that's taking place in addition to the soldiers on the, on the front lines. So it was about 1 in the morning on October 17th, 10 days after fighting, we all of a sudden got word that the IDF had hit a hospital, a Baptist hospital in Gaza, and 500 people were killed. We all had our heads in our hands saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe that they did that. I, I, can't, I, I can't believe it. They probably didn't do that. But all of a sudden, you saw BBC, CNN, Reuters, uh, New York Times. Al Jazeera. Al of course Al Jazeera. Wow. <laughs> uh, you know, you know it, it took us, it took, even now we're still counting the number of people that were dead uh, from October 7th and the horrific massacre, but within seconds, of course, 500 people were killed. And uh, we started to get within a few moments rumblings that maybe the IDF wasn't behind the strike. In real time now, we're, we're talking one in the morning, I'm on the phone with the IDF spokesperson. I'm on the phone with the prime minister's advisor telling them, you need to get a statement out as soon as possible because this thing is going gangbusters in the international media and Israel's getting destroyed. They said they know. They said, you don't understand. Before we can release a statement, we have to check every single point where we possibly could have fired a shot from to make sure that none of them uh, fired the shot that went towards that hospital. Then they had to check their surveillance footage uh, where they were able to see that their rockets were incoming and they saw that the, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket that was supposed to go to Haifa took a left turn and went like this. And they had the, they had the surveillance uh, footage from audio where you have Hamas operators basically saying, really, we did it? Yeah, it looks like it was our shrapnel, it's not their shrapnel, it looks like we did it. Can you believe it? Anyways, JNS was... I had the statements from the IDF and the Prime Minister's office before they tweeted them out. And JNS was the first news organization to report that in fact it was a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket. And not only was it a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket, not the IDF, but that rocket didn't even hit the hospital. It hit the parking lot outside the hospital. And all footage shows that the hospital building is completely intact with the little shrapnel markets, marks on the facade. Uh, and not only that, it happened after 12 o'clock at night, 
and how many people could have possibly been in the parking lot of the hospital at 12 o'clock at night, so it certainly wasn't 500 people killed, and according to some es estimates, it's probably less than 20. Uh, so every single part of that narrative was false, but you see how the, uh, how the narrative warfare takes place. It's all part of a psychological war that's being waged, which includes the taking of hostages, uh, it includes the, the media, it includes the, the question of civilian casualties, it would include also if Israeli soldiers would, God forbid, get killed fighting inside Gaza. All this is part of the psychological war that Hamas is waging on Israel. And all those mainstream media outlets that are publishing the false news of, of, that's coming out of, out of Gaza are essentially Hamas's Ministry of Information. Um, I, I'm very privileged to be joined on this panel by my good friend and, and colleague and, and uh, partner in, in telling the story of the Jewish people, Joel Pollack. I think you're the senior editor at large at Breitbart. And uh, Joel will tell you more, but, but he, he went right down to the south and he saw things that people shouldn't see. And he'll tell you a little bit about it and then we'll take questions. Thank you all for being here. This is, I believe, my 14th time at RJC, sometimes as a member, sometimes as a journalist, and today has been very intense already. I learned about the attacks when I was in synagogue on Simchat Torah or Shmini Atzeret, and I raced uphill to my home, and I've spent the last three weeks working on covering the story of the terror attacks in Israel and the response to those attacks. And a few days into this, I said to my wife, I have to go. I have to go to Israel. I can't do this from here. I can't sit at a distance while this is going on and really understand what the Israeli people are going through. I also can't get dragged into fights over social media with people who don't know any better than I do about what's going on. I have to go there. Where were you? So I went to, uh, I live in Los Angeles. Uh, and I went to Israel, and I was based in Jerusalem, mostly for logistical reasons. Jerusalem, thus far, except, except for what Alex mentioned the first few days, Jerusalem has been relatively isolated from the rocket attacks. So it was a better place to, to be, even though most of what I wanted to see was elsewhere. I just went. I didn't really have an agenda. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but I went. And it happened to be that as I was there, the Israeli government started taking journalists into the communities that were attacked on October 7th and started showing the international media the evidence of what happened. So I went down to Kibbutz Be'eri, which is one of the hardest hit communities, and that community had 108 people murdered out of 1,100 residents in the community. They took us there. Actually, we sat on the roadside for about an hour. This is a military convoy with a bus of journalists. We sat on the roadside because right before we were supposed to go in, they found one of the Hamas terrorists who had infiltrated and who had stayed inside the country. They thought there were about 12 of them who were still in the country. And they evidently, they had trained to live without food for quite a long period of time. Eventually, he gave himself up. but. There had been a firefight at the kibbutz about an hour before we were supposed to go there. We went in and we saw everything you may have seen on social media, but in case you haven't, we saw the blood-stained homes, the bullet holes in kindergarten windows, the doors of bomb shelters blown up by grenades or rocket-propelled grenades. We saw children's toys strewn about, crushed underneath tank tracks that came in when the IDF finally arrived. We spoke to volunteer security members of the kibbutz who fought for 12 hours against the terrorists and ran out of bullets until one or two reservists started trickling in, making it through the perimeter and giving them more ammunition. And we saw a scene of devastation. We saw a scene of a pogrom, a scene that could have been right out of the Holocaust of this closely knit community that had been absolutely devastated. And the international journalists walked around and people stepped over the wreckage. One of my colleagues went into a home and opened the refrigerator. The food was still good in the refrigerator. These are people who had stocked their fridge for the holiday weekend and they were planning a holiday meal. Probably for me, the most heartbreaking thing, obviously there's so much to feel depressed about in that 
setting, but what was heartbreaking there and in other places was to see the Sukkot still up because, of course, it was the last day of the Sukkot holiday, and many people, whether religious or secular, had the Sukkot up in their backyards, and, and of course, they never got to finish celebrating their holiday, and the decorations were on the ground, and, and some of the Sukkot were wrecked by the violence and so forth. Obviously, a Sukkah is a temporary shelter, not the life of a human being, but to me, it was a connection to what was going on in the kibbutz at that time. The next day, we were taken to a military base where they were identifying the dead bodies. <coughs> and they showed us a huge lineup of refrigerated trucks. This particular base processed 768 uh, dead people out of the 1,400 total. And they were still working when we were there and they opened up two of the refrigerated trucks. We didn't see the actual bodies, but we saw the body bags inside. The smell is, despite the refrigeration, it's the smell of decaying bodies. It's, it's unmistakable, and it was everywhere all at once. And we talked to the forensic dentists and forensic examiners who were trying to determine the causes of death. It was very difficult. Many of the bodies were mutilated. Many of them were burned. They told us that the thing they feared the most was opening the body bag to see what the cause of death was because the lucky ones were just shot. The others were mutilated, some were burned beyond recognition, some took days to identify because all they had was bone fragments, some had been tied up, some had, some had been raped. The, these were terrible things to witness. The other thing we saw was, you may have seen this on the news, we were taken into another IDF base and we were shown 43 minutes of raw footage of the Hamas attack. They have hours and hours and hours of footage. Some of it is from GoPro cameras that the terrorists wore to record what they were doing. Some of it, some of it is from dashboard cameras that were in cars. Some of it was from surveillance cameras, security cameras in some of these communities. And it was absolutely devastating. I'll get to questions in a second. For me, and I've written about this, so if you've read my articles about it, you're not hearing it for the first time, and I'm just giving you a warning, some of what I'm going to describe is very disturbing. But for me, especially as a father of three kids, the hardest thing to watch was the surveillance camera from one of the kibbutzim. We weren't actually allowed to tell people which one because the family themselves hadn't been notified of what had happened in this particular house. But you see a father and two sons in their underwear waking up, and frantically trying to escape the house. They run into the backyard, they go into a bomb shelter that's in the backyard, sort of a concrete shelter. These are set up all over the southern communities of Israel because sometimes there isn't enough time to get underground when there's a red alert for a rocket. They only have 15 to 30 seconds, so sometimes they just have to run into some place that's nearby. You see the father carry one son and the other runs behind them into the shelter and then you see a heavily armed Palestinian terrorist lean over the fence and throw a grenade into the shelter. You then see the grenade explode, the father falls down, dead, and the two boys come out covered in blood. They go into the house and they're crying, Daddy, Daddy, Abba, Abba, and the one son who appears to be not as badly injured as the other says, Why am I alive? You know, you never forget, you'll never forget, I mean, I hope you never see it, I will never forget it. But to see those boys suffering, and, and it actually was worse than that, I'm, I'm leaving out a couple of the details, but the Hamas terrorist walks into the frid, the, the, the kitchen where these boys are suffering, and he says to them, do you, want, do you want maim, do you want water? Not do you want first aid for your terrible wounds, one of the boys has very bad wounds. Do you want first aid, uh, do you want water? And, and the Israeli boy, one of them, answers in English, I want my mommy. Mommy sounds like mayim, sounds like the Hebrew word uh, for water. It's, it's absolutely devastating to see this. When I was in the room watching the footage, I heard journalists behind me. These are international journalists. Many of them are war correspondents. I heard them saying quietly, some of them, make it stop. Stop the film. That's how disturbing it was. They didn't stop the film. I looked at my watch when that scene was with the boys. It was 17 minutes into a 43-minute film. I said, if I, if I had a choice in the matter, I would stop now, but I know I have to finish. That's what we saw in Israel. 
that was, that was the worst of humanity. But I also want to tell you that I saw the best of humanity. The very, very best. The first interview I did in Israel was of a classmate of mine from Skokie, Illinois, who made Aliyah when he was 18 and he joined the IDF. And he was working in San Diego as a cantor when he got called up to join the reserves. He had come home to Jerusalem. He's in one of the elite special forces units. And he told me that he was prepared to die to make sure that nothing like this ever happened to any Israeli child ever again. I, I saw volunteers going into the towns most affected by rockets, taking food, sometimes 900 meals a day, to make sure that Holocaust survivors and disabled people who couldn't be evacuated easily, that they could have warm meals because they couldn't prepare food for themselves. Many of them moved too slowly to get to bomb shelters, so they just stay in the bomb shelter. So these people were taking food into the line of fire. These people were providing for orphans who lost their parents. I went to a center that was set up by Israelis, not by the government, just civil society. I went to a center that they set up for the families of hostages and missing people to help them try to locate their relatives, but also to give them support, psychological support, to give them meals if they needed it. And I was amazed by the bravery. Of course, we talk about the bravery of the soldiers, but I was also amazed by the bravery of the civilians. There was a woman there I met who had gone to the center day after day because her daughter, who had been at the music festival, was missing. And the thing she dreaded most was that her daughter would be taken captive into Gaza. And she learned her daughter had been killed. They identified the daughter's body. So she went home and she sat Shiva for a week. She mourned for a week. And then she came back to the center. She came back because she wanted to help the other people. Through all of her pain, she still felt she had something to give everybody else. That's the resilience and that's the heroism of the ordinary person in Israel. And the mood in Israel, despite the terrible pain of this loss, is one of incredible unity and incredible resolve. There is no force on earth that is going to keep the Israeli Defense Forces out of Gaza. Those mothers and fathers are going into Gaza to make sure this never happens again. And they're patient. It doesn't have to happen today. It doesn't have to happen tomorrow, although it's starting already. They are prepared to wait for however long it takes to go in there and to get rid of Hamas. We talk about it as if it's a subject for debate between the Biden administration and the Netanyahu government. It's not up for debate. It's, it's absolutely happening. And, and Alex says it's time for questions, so let's take a few of those. Yeah. On, on, any, on any topic, but I would just say that Questions, the way questions work is that they take less than 30 seconds to ask and they end with a question mark. Okay. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, Joel, thank you very much for that. Uh, one question I have is Is the media going to hopefully get together and push the Israeli government to develop, to build a museum and to collect all this information presented like we do at Yad Vashem or the Holocaust Museum in Washington? I think this event should be memorialized in Gaza no, we'll and be. along with perhaps I'm some sure other we'll uh, memorials. Did everybody hear the question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the answer is they're already doing it. And the IDF told us that they are working now to commemorate this event. And it is being considered by Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial in Israel, as among the family of tragic Holocaust related events. So they are doing it. They have w many, many terabytes of, of footage from the videos. Um, they will be talking to survivors and things like that, but they are already doing it. Even while they're fighting the war, they're already commemorating the terror attack in that way. Uh, what's the right way to take this? You just choose anyone. <laughs> uh, okay, right. Yeah, you, you mentioned that the Israelis are going into Gaza, regardless of what anybody says, including the Americans, but is that reality in terms of the weapons that the U.S. needs to provide? I mean, if the Biden administration gets, you know, uh, cowardly on this and says well, you got to stop or else, are you telling me that the Israeli government is still going to go without the support of the U.S. in Gaza? Did everybody hear the question? The question was, do I really think that the Israeli military will go into Gaza even if the United States were not going to support Israel? I think so. I think they would go in anyway. What about the weapons? The weapons. Israel has enough weapons to fight the war as it needs to do based on the supply of weapons. The way Israel would prefer to fight the war 
is in a very humanitarian way distinguishing clearly between civilians and combatants and using the Iron Dome missile system to knock out Palestinian rockets. Those weapons all need to be replenished. The Iron Dome batteries are in danger of being exhausted. In fact, there were soldiers killed on October 7th because they were going to retrieve more Iron Dome rockets. They ran out of Iron Dome rockets at some of the batteries because there were simply so many Hamas rockets. But Israel has the weaponry currently to fight a very different kind of war, which would not be careful and humanitarian and, and involve a long struggle. Israel can fight a much uh, shorter struggle if it needs to. But there's no, there is no Israeli government that could survive if the Israeli military didn't go into Gaza and do this. The, the, the entire spectrum of Israeli public opinion, short of maybe, let's say, 5%, that's always on, on the radical fringe, the entire spectrum is united behind going into Gaza. And I, don't, and I think, to its, to its credit, the Biden administration understands that. And I don't think they're going to let Israel uh, fall short. Can people stand up? You know, I think that uh, oh, he's asking about the hostages and should uh, humanitarian aid be conditioned on the release of hostages. Yeah, you know, I, you haven't seen, I think, in the history of war, any party that is fighting the war that's being asked to provide humanitarian aid for the other side. You know, I think you're seeing that the, the families of the hostages in, in Israel are rightly saying, why are we providing humanitarian aid if the hostages are still being held. Uh, you know, but of course, you saw over the last period, uh, Joe Biden, uh, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, Emmanuel Macron, the President of France, uh, Maloney, the Prime Minister of Italy, and the Prime Minister of Greece, and the Prime Minister of Romania, uh, and others all coming to Israel. And I believe that part of Netanyahu's strategy is to try to get uh, as the leaders of the free world together behind a strike. As, as Joel said, um, Israel is going to go in. Netanyahu said in all those speeches that it's going to be a long and difficult battle, and he wanted support for that. And if uh, giving some, a little bit of humanitarian aid, and so far I believe there's been a few dozen trucks that have moved through the Rafa border, they're going to do it because they think that the, having the support of the international community is, is, is essential. Yeah. Starving them out, and also just we should one question and not follow up questions. But uh, yeah, there, right now you're seeing that that uh, the situation in Gaza is growing more severe. Uh, food is running out, uh, fuel is running out, which means that electricity is running out. We saw reports on Thursday that the entire communications and cell phone networks are down now in Gaza, and, and also the fuel uh, makes a big a big impact on the ability of the Hamas to circulate air in the tunnels. Uh, which is a, a big deal too. But when it comes to the hostages, I, I do want to say that Israel will certainly try as hard as they can to get the hostages and to find them. And I do believe that they've been gathering intelligence and they know where, where some of the hostages, if not all or, or as many as possible, are located. But it's going to have to potentially be a secondary uh, goal of, of retrieving all the hostages. They know the risks that are involved. And the most important objective right now is to make sure that Hamas can never take a hostage again. The backs. So will this uh, conflict end uh, the Saudi steps towards possibly joining the Abraham Accords? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great question. And, and oh, he asked about if uh, people should stand up when they ask the questions. Uh, but uh, but the, the question is, what, what impact will, will this conflict have on uh, normalization with Saudi Arabia? I think that, as you know, Saudi Arabia was, was negotiating with Israel toward normalization, a continuation of the Abraham Accords. And this is actually one of the reasons why Hamas decided to launch this war backed by Iran, is to stop the normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. If Israel and Saudi Arabia, which is the, the host, the custodian of Islam's two holy sites, Mecca and Medina, make normalization of peace with Israel, that could essentially be considered the end of the greater Arab-Israeli conflict, which Iran certainly doesn't want. Um, and I think that Saudi Arabia is watching very, very closely right now. 
Why did Saudi want to normalize with, with Israel? Because they have a common enemy, and that's Iran. Uh, and they've, you know, one of the reasons, anyways. And they believe, Saudi Arabia believes that Israel is the only power in the region that can betray Iran or that would potentially attack Iran uh, if they started to become more and more belligerent. And I think they're looking very closely at what happens. If Israel will defeat Hamas in a very conclusive way to the point that everybody understands that Israel won this conflict and Hamas has lost, I think that that means that uh, the normalization with Saudi Arabia is going to move forward at a rapid pace. However, if Hamas somehow and Hezbollah and Iran are able to come out and even claim a victory, whether or not that is, is actually the case, I think Saudi Arabia is also going to be watching closely, and I think that that would put a pause in the relations between uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel, because if Israel cannot even beat Hamas, which is by all accounts one of Iran's smaller tentacles in the region, then what good are they to Saudi Arabia? So I think it's very important what happens here. Um, I, I, I don't hear anything about the uh, plans about the tunnels. Has the IDF, well, I guess not announced, but it, does it seem feasible? Uh, that part of their plans are to destroy the tunnels. It's a, I know it's a huge multiple network. The question was about the tunnels in Gaza. I don't know that they have a plan specifically regarding the tunnels. Obviously they regard that as the greatest threat because the network of tunnels is very well known to Hamas and not very well known to Israeli soldiers. But in his latest address to the Israeli nation, Prime Minister Netanyahu emphasized that they will fight Hamas underground as well as above ground. So they're definitely preparing to go into the tunnel network and I think they realize that may be the only way to eliminate Hamas. They're also trying to bomb some of the tunnels um, from the air by using underground detonating explosives. But uh, they also know that some of the hostages are in the tunnels. They're going to have to fight some of the war inside the tunnels. It's an incredible risk to Israeli soldiers, and I think everybody understands it, and everybody is prepared to face it. From so many places here, millions of our, I know my personal money, not millions of mine personally, but a lot of money is going to supplies. How do we know which organizations to send to, how things are getting there, what's needed, and who to put our, tr our financial trust in to get supplies to the IDF? <coughs> I hear lots of stories. Did everyone hear the question about supplies to the IDF? How do we know which supplies are needed if we're part of buying supplies, how do we know which organizations to trust? And the truth is, I don't know um, in terms of hardware like bulletproof vests. I've heard different stories. I've heard that they've had so many come in that they're not enough, or you need special export licenses, or they have to comply with certain criteria. What I've been telling people is the best place to donate, if you don't have a specific set of people to go through for a specific request, is uh, Zaka, which is the first responders organization, which you can find, I think it's at zakaworld.org in the US. It's a nonprofit, I think it's also a 501c3. They are the first responders who were the first on the scene when the army secured the southern communities. Their primary purpose is to collect the remains of people who are killed, but they have evolved since then into paramedic service, search and rescue. They get sent to other countries to help with their natural disasters and so forth. So if you donate to Zaka, you know that even if you're not helping the immediate crisis now, those funds will be used in the future for a good purpose, certainly. And there, there may be, unfortunately, there may be more need as the war goes on and as people start uh, being exposed to more risk. Yeah. Forcefully. What type of force is Hezbollah. 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 H
Yeah, it's a, it's a very important question. And the border with Hezbollah, the, the, the northern border, has been very, very active over the last uh, week plus. Uh, there has been many Hezbollah operatives killed by Israel. On the Lebanon side of the border, Hezbollah has fired many uh, anti-tank guided missiles at Israeli positions. There's been drones that have been sent from uh, Hezbollah into Israel and, and even Hamas also has chapters in southern Lebanon has also been trying to to make this border turn into a, an active an active multi-front battle by all accounts the Hezbollah threat is much greater than the threat of Hamas um, as you know if Hamas has fired already probably about 8,000 rockets into Israel most of those are crude Qassam rockets that uh, can travel 45, 50 kilometers, deliver a payload that could kill many, but uh, a relatively uh, much lighter payload than the, than the Hezbollah missiles. Hezbollah has 150,000 plus missiles, many of them long range, many of them precision guided, and could deliver much more serious payloads. And if that border opens up, there's no doubt that that border has to be addressed first and foremost by Israel, even more than the Hamas border, which for the most part at this point is contained. Israel certainly wants to take out Hamas uh, completely, but in terms of protecting the home front, they can contain the border uh, in the south, whereby Hamas can't do any more damage to the Israeli home front aside from the rockets that they're firing, which Israel shoots most of them out of the sky with the Iron Dome. And they'd have to go in uh, and, uh, and take care of Hezbollah because the amount of missiles that they have and the, the threat of those missiles is so great that they could not simply absorb them the way they're trying to absorb the Qassam rockets. I think that a, a big part of the U.S. presence in, in the Eastern Mediterranean with these two U.S. carrier groups is that in addition to the planes that those carriers have is also very sophisticated missile defense. We saw already a week ago that uh, Houthis in Yemen were firing long-range missiles at Israel from, from below Saudi Arabia toward Eilat. And the USS John Carney, which is not a, a carrier group, uh, fire, shot down uh, most of these rockets. Actually, it's also some reports that the Saudis might have shot down some of those rockets as well. But these carrier groups that the United States has placed have very significant missile defense capabilities on them. And so that actually assists Israel tremendously if all of a sudden Hezbollah starts to fire because the big threat is that if Hezbollah fires in rapid fire that there's no amount of Iron Dome, David Sling, Arrow or these other long range sophisticated missile defense systems they could be overrun by these rockets. So having, having this extra defense capabilities there is important. Carol. Um, for a number of years, the po our, politici our political friends could not talk enough about the nuclear threat of Iran. Mm -hmm. Now that Iran's cutouts, Hezbollah and Hamas, are attacking threshold nuclear Iran is nowhere to be heard about. What we do hear from them, from the politicians, is that, quote, we don't want a wider war. In other words, don't ask us about the nuclear threat from Iran. How do we get this ultimate existential binary threat back on the agenda? Because either they become nuclear or they don't. The Democrats think they can bribe Iran and put it off, and the Republicans think they can sanction Iran and put it off. They're so wrong. It's binary. And how do we get it back on the agenda? I think that's a very good question. And you reminded me of something that a friend of mine in Israel told me that I should tell you, which, which is that the lesson of what happened on October 7th is that when your enemy tells you what they're going to do, believe it. You know I myself. And, and, and in Israel, they're not focusing on the past right now. They're not focusing on the mistakes yet. They have the war to win. But it's now well known that observation posts near Gaza were reporting for weeks that there was activity near the border fence, that there were Hamas people showing up with maps 
at the fence that people were seeing all kinds of activity. There were paragliders who were training. And all of this was in plain view, but it was not interpreted to be a threat. The lesson on Iran is the same. Iran is threatening to wipe Israel out, and that has to be taken very seriously. Now, you know, whether that means launching a preemptive strike, I don't know. I think both the United States and Israel would prefer to see internal political change in Iran. There's some chance that might have happened in 2009 if Obama hadn't rescued the regime. Maybe it might have happened after 2020 if President Trump had remained in office with the maximum pressure policy. We don't know. But I do know this. The Iranians understand that the presence of the two carriers in the eastern Mediterranean means that there really could be a coordinated strike by Israel and the United States if the war escalates. And I would say this. We hear about the carriers. What we don't hear about are the submarines. The submarines are there. We don't know how many. But these submarines have the capability to strike Iran as well. And Iran knows it. They don't know where the submarines are. But that's what people don't talk about. But that's definitely happening. So I think it's very unlikely Iran escalates. I think that there are, they are, at least for now, going to be held in check because they understand that it really is an existential threat to their own power. They're going to suffer the loss of Hamas. But uh, they will hope, I think, to, to wait the crisis out and then return and continue arming other proxies. Whether it goes in that direction is, is really up to them. I don't think that the United States, just to answer an earlier question, I don't think the US is going to directly engage fighting with Hezbollah. I think they're going to, in the event of a war with Hezbollah, I think they're going to be there to hold Iran in check. What I learned when I was in Israel is that the common opinion, at least, among people who understand how these things work, is that if Hezbollah joins the fight in a very serious way, not just firing the odd anti-tank missile now and again, but actually getting involved in serious rocket fire, Israel is not going to be restrained the way it is in Gaza. In Gaza, the international community considers that Israel has some kind of responsibility to the Palestinian civilians because they don't think that Hamas has any responsibility, which is perverse, but that's the way it goes. Lebanon has a government. Hezbollah is part of the government. If Hezbollah attacks Israel from Lebanon, Israel is not going to be going to hold back. It will hold the Lebanese government accountable for that, and it will attack with a far greater ferocity and firepower and with far fewer restraints in southern Lebanon, both because, as Alex said, the threat is much bigger, but also because there's a government, there's an address to which you can send the complaint. And, you know, we never ask Hamas to surrender. Somehow in the media, it's always like, Israel should cease fire. No one ever says Hamas should surrender. Well, in Lebanon, the Lebanese government, which is run by Hezbollah, has a choice. And if they make the wrong choice, then Israel is going to go in 100%. It's not going to be little pinprick strikes. It's, it's going to be very, very massive. Uh, so coming back to your experience with the international media, does your experience with the, with the journalists and uh, their exposure to the horrors of the massacre, do you have any hope for, it, if not necessarily an individual media outlet, but individual journalists changing their coverage of Israel to actually apply actual journalistic standards? Did everybody hear the question? Yeah. The question was, do I have any hope that journalists in the international media will change the way they cover these events? To actual journalism. To become actual journalism. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, well, the journalists who were with me were, were very deeply moved by what they saw. But journalists, and I'm not talking yet about pro-Israel bias or pro-Palestinian bias or whatever, but journalists by their nature want to cover things that are happening now. So if you go to Sterot, which I went to as well as some of the other communities, and you look around Sterot, Sterot is a ghost town. It's been emptied out, it's been evacuated. There are some people still in their apartments and they're getting relief efforts from elsewhere in Israel. But I went to the Sterot police station, which has been demolished because Hamas terrorists holed up in there and they had a 20 hour gunfight with the IDF and the IDF destroyed the police station. But you can walk around the street and there still are bullet casings, both from the Israeli weapons and the Hamas weapons, all over the street, all over the sidewalk. But that's not where the journalists are. They're not reporting on what happened. There's a hill outside Sterot, like on the, right on the edge of town. And you've probably seen, 
If you've watched any media coverage the last 48 hours, you've seen journalists with their cameras showing you Gaza from that hill. And that's the hill that everybody knows, and you go there, and I actually took video there. It's, it's, it would be funny if it weren't so sad, but the journalists are there, and there's a row of cameras, and you see the airstrikes in the distance, and you see the smoke rising up from Gaza every now and then, and it's a very bizarre experience. And what's even more bizarre is that the reporters in front of the cameras are in helmets and flak jackets, fully equipped as if they're in a war zone, but the people behind the cameras have baseball hats and t-shirts. <laughs> because they're really at a far distance from the fighting. I mean, yes, there's some theoretical risk, but what you're seeing on television, what journalists are trying to portray, is where the action is. They go where things are happening. So the person on television in a helmet and flak jacket conveys, I'm in the heart of the action. When the reality is that, you know, I, I took a selfie with myself and my, you know, my own baseball hat and t-shirt, kind of like, you know, what's going on here? Um, journalists go where the action is. It's not just international journalists. Uh, if you watch the White House briefings, which are always informative, by the way, they're, they're very good. Uh, <laughs> um, if you watch the White House briefings, the, the most recent one, half the questions were about Palestinian civilians, okay? They want to know what's being done about Palestinian civilians. That's where the pressure is. And that's the issue. That's the issue because that's where the action is. The bombs are falling on Gaza, so that's what the journalists are concerned about. They're not concerned about any amount of uh, suffering that the hostages might be undergoing because they can't report it. They can't get to the hostages. So Israel, in a sense, is at a disadvantage in this regard because Israel is, is a country that is comfortable for journalists to live in. They can still uh, take off their flak jackets and their helmets and go home and have a you know, kosher McDonald's before they go to bed. Um, but this is the innate bias of journalism. They're going where the action is, where the sympathy is. And so the story right now is all about Palestinian civilians. And by the way, that's, that's a, the reason a lot of these kids on campus are out marching for the Palestinian cause. Many of them don't, you know, they can't find any of these places on a map, but they, they hear that the, the Palestinian civilians are the weakest and most vulnerable people in this whole situation, and that's how they've decided what right is and what wrong is. They've forgotten already what happened three weeks ago. They forgot who started this. They forgot how they started it. And that's where your question about Yad Vashem becomes very important. The Israeli military is trying very hard to commemorate this so that people don't forget. If you watch Jonathan Conricus, who's the Israeli uh, military spokesman on on Twitter, he's very, very good. He starts many of his briefings by saying, let's just remember how this started. He has to take the journalists back to the beginning because otherwise they'll just focus on what's happening today. So, I mean, I think it was also very predictable from the moment that this happened that the international community was gonna be with Israel because on October 7th, Israel was the victim. But the day after, now Israel's the aggressor. And, uh, you know, and that we, we already were able to see within 48 hours how this was going to turn. And it was a very predictable turn that, it, that it's taken. And it's going to continue to be that way, um, you know, regardless of, of what gets commemorated. Like you said, that, that's yesterday's news. And, and people expect, you know, this is just part of a greater conflict. And this was just the latest attack. And now there needs to be proportionality. But what they don't understand is that for Israel, the red line has been crossed. And there's not going to be any concept anymore of proportionality that Israel is actually intent this time on removing Hamas from power, and, and that's and that's a different that's a different ball game. And but the the media is still caught up in the same uh, terms of engagement a, as was in previous uh, flare-ups. Let's get back to questions. I just want to say one thing about that term proportionality. It has a precise definition in international law, and it's not how many people are killed on each side. Proportionality measures whether a military response has a reasonable risk to civilians. If your goal is to stop Hamas from firing rockets, then a smaller number of civilian casualties is acceptable because that's a narrower goal. But if your goal is to remove Hamas from power, and if that goal is legitimate, and in this case it is, then a larger number of civilian casualties becomes acceptable. That's proportionality. It's, it measures the relationship to the military goal, not the numbers of dead on each side. So I wouldn't say that Israel is throwing proportionality out the window. It's just that the goal is so much bigger. And the world doesn't quite understand that yet. But the goal is a legitimate goal. It's bigger. And that means there is going to be greater risk to civilian casualties. And that is lawful. That is legal under international law.
give up the heads of yeah. Hamas. I see no call for that. Now the question is, how come nobody's asked Hutter, Qatar to uh, give up the, the heads of Hamas that are living in, in Qatar? I think the only reason that hasn't happened yet is that they're the only go-betweens when it comes to hostages and, and uh, Hamas. The only reason. Now, Netanyahu said in the beginning that he wants to see countries apply sanctions to Qatar. The United States has military bases in Qatar. We have a major air base there. We have Central Command of the Middle East located there. It's really bizarre that we have our major military base literally within a, a stone's throw from the five-star hotels where these Hamas guys are planning the deaths of Israelis and the deaths of their fellow Palestinians. But it's unfortunate that Doug Burgum doesn't quite have the charisma of other candidates because he was the one person today who said, we need to think about designating Qatar as a state sponsor of terrorism, and we need to say now that the Hamas leaders in Doha are legitimate military targets. And I do think that is actually necessary because I think that it's not tolerable to allow this bizarre situation where they sit in their hot tubs in Doha and plan the murder of innocent civilians. It's a two-part question. Um, first part is how reliable are the statistics that come out of the Palestinian Gaza Health Ministry and uh, how much of it is Pallywood uh, meant for the, the cameras? The question was about statistics coming out of the Gaza Health Ministry about casualties and how much is Pallywood? Pallywood referring to uh, dramatized violence for the sake of international consumption. You know, uh, if, if you see, there's, there's one guy who's very famous on TikTok right now or on social media. Uh, people call him the uh, FAFO guy. Do you know what that means? Yeah, yeah well. FAFO uh, <laughs> stands for fuck around and find out. And, <laughs> and uh, what happened was in the early days of the war, he's a pro Hamas social media guy, and he took a selfie video of himself live streaming as the attack was going on on October 7th, and they were firing rockets from Gaza, and he was shouting, Allahu Akbar, this is great. And then a few days later, he posted a video of himself crying during the bomb strikes, the airstrikes, and saying, oh, this is terrible, Israel's doing this terrible thing. So it became a kind of meme among pro-Israel bloggers on social media to put the first video next to the second one, as if to say, how it started, how it's going. Um, <laughs> but there was another video that was produced where you see this young man in a hospital bed and he's suffering and he's writhing in pain and then you realize it's the same guy. He basically is the same actor from these other, these other videos. That's Pallywood. That's basically these, these, these ridiculous depictions of suffering. That's not to say there aren't people who are suffering, but oftentimes the suffering that's portrayed to the world is dramatized. Um, how reliable are the health statistics? Yeah. Look at the Hollywood. I mean, look at the hospital incident. I don't the think we have to go incident, into right. it more than right. that. Um, the, the, the statistics at the hospital, right, they said, as, he, as Alex said, 500 dead, they decided within a few minutes. Um, I will say this, though. What the journalists in the White House brought up when they questioned John Kirby about this, Kirby said you can't trust health statistics from, you can't trust death statistics from the Gaza Health Ministry, it's a Hamas agency. They said, yes, but the State Department itself has used these statistics in the past, and they have turned out to be reliable. Usually when Hamas or the health ministry says a thousand people died, by the end of the war they added up and a thousand people died. But the key part they're missing and what they leave out is what percentage of the deaths are combatants? What percentage of the deaths are Hamas members? If you remember when the U.S. Embassy opened in Jerusalem in 2018, Hamas engineered some riots near the Gaza border and 60 some odd Palestinians were killed. 